Step into the brand new world of compacts. Dodge Demon for 71. Priced way down there, but it's got it all. Torsion bar suspension, unibody construction. Smart, roomy, comfortable. New Dodge Demon joins Dodge Dart for 71. The spirit of 71 is Dodge 71. This year, you can't afford not to be Dodge material. This episode is brought to you in part by the all-new Treo Vision camera. Order yours today. To come across a 1971 Dodge Demon 340, well, that's a good thing. To come across a 1971 Dodge Demon 340 with a six-pack built by and sold by Mr. Norms, that's a great thing. You add in the fact that this car is not only all that, but it is loaded with documentation, and you name it on the documentation. One of the most documented cars we've ever done. We have the original Monroney window sticker for it. We have the point of sale from Grand Spalding Dodge showing how much money they paid for it, how much money was put down. The entire deal is right there. We have the original key tag, the original keys, the code on it, the envelope that those keys came in. Literally, we have every single piece of literature and documentation that a person would have got when they went in and bought that car brand new. Somebody somewhere had the forethought to save all of that documentation and keep it preserved and in good shape so that one day it could go with the car. Well, here we are, it's one day. And that car very likely because of all this documentation and being a Mr. Norm's car is a one of one ever made. This time on Graveyard Cars, Mark and Justin begin assembly on the ultra rare and highly documented 1971 Mr. Norm's Dodge Demon. Then, the team shifts gears to focus on a Graveyard Dreams made-to-order 1969 Charger Tribute car. But can the ghouls get these gorgeous Mopar icons on track and through the shop? Or will a miscommunication grind progress to a halt? Why wait three months after we put the drive train in it? Sir, it has not been three months. That drive train's been in there for over three months. Three months he takes to do that. This is what I deal with all day long. Look at it. Find out on this episode of Graveyard Cars. everybody up on our little 1971 Dodge Demon. This is our Mr. Norm's car. This is a real Mr. Norm's car. As mentioned earlier, very well documented car, perhaps one of the most documented cars you've ever had. The fact that it's a Mr. Norm's car and documented the way it is is even better yet. Now when we got the car, it was partially disassembled. I knew it had some rust. The rust was what I would refer to as middle of the road rust okay meaning there was a lot of things like the main floor the trunk floor the trunk floor extensions they had to be replaced but other areas such as the rockers or the side of the firewall or cowl side panels these needed small patches in them so we were able to do that and it didn't take a whole lot of time once it got through the metal shop we kicked it to mud mud had it for very little time because it's a pretty small car and then they kicked it over to will who did a beautiful job of painting it So the drivetrain Doug and I did collectively. Once it was put together in detail, we put it on the engine run stand, ran it for a while, found a little oil leak that wasn't really a problem other than Dougie kind of sort of forgot to tighten down the adapter for the oil filter. But with that done, we were able to put it on the K-member, all restored. Last time you guys saw the car, we had installed it in the car and we were able to let the car down on the ground and have it as a complete roller. So one of the things that I told Justin a while back that I wanted to be involved with was the installing of the hood scoops and some of the front end ornamentation on it. Now we should have had that done a long time ago, but Will is just now, just now, getting to the blackout on it. 
I'll get to the bottom of this right now. This is why I invented the whole trail cam in the first place, right here. Yeah. Well, right there. There he is. Question for you, sir. <laughs> Will, why are you just now- Why are now you with that stupid in? The tray cam thing is just absolutely insane. I hate every aspect of it. Why are you just now painting out the black on the, on the demon, Bubba? You don't want me to? No, I do want you to three months ago. What's it gonna take to get that done? Alyssa already broke one and all of a sudden here comes another one. It takes good moments when you have like Wendell in his car, about ready to cry and all emotional. Then here comes Mark making it all about him with that piece of camera. Nobody likes it and it needs to just go away. Why are you painting orange if you're supposed to be painting black? Oh, uh, because I'm wrapping up the SEMA car. Oh, nice. I have a question for you. Yeah. What would it take for you to finish a car before you pull it out of the booth? What would it take for you to actually get a drive chair in a car so I can put the stripes on it? We're, we're trying to get ready for SEMA. I've got the orange paint going, and SEMA's always real time here at the shop, no joke. So it's like, you gotta get stuff done. There is no time to screw around. Then he comes in with that dang camera, and it's just very frustrating. So about an hour that I my day I lose for silliness. How can you paint a car, physically paint a car, if it's not got the drivetrain on it? The painting aspect of these cars is very technical, and it's one of those things you just, it's not like assembly that just, ooh, we're gonna put a wheel on, you know, big deal. What? This is technical. You need to be left alone. You need to be focused. You know, and I don't get that luxury. It needs to have the drivetrain in it to put the stripes on it. Why? Because once you put the drivetrain in it, Josh will go over, do all his final adjustments because the car moves on a wordly. And once he does his final adjustments, and then I put the stripes on, because I don't want to put the stripes on, have them adjusted, have them not line up accurately. Now that's a very good answer. I agree with the answer, but I have another question for you. Yeah. Why wait three months after we put the I train in it? Sir, it's not been three months. That drive train has been in there for over three months. Three months he takes to do that. This is what I deal with all day long. Look at it. Mark's got me talking to, I don't know, a dozen or so clients that don't want to know where their car is at. And I'm like, then they're going to see the shit on TV. And they're like, don't wonder why my car's not done. <laughs> <laughs>So when it comes to using our hot rod black paint that we use to duplicate the stripes, it's a real finicky product. And what I'm saying is, for the best results for this, it needs to be below 70 degrees and dry naturally. If you bake it or if it gets too hot, it dries uneven. In the great state of Oregon here, it's 90 degrees. And we're in this dilemma of, we need to get this car done so I can get it back over to assembly and get the car out of here. When you get with these temperatures and this product, what could happen is, some spots will dry faster, some will dry slower, and it won't all dry evenly. So if I shoot it like 60 degrees, let it breathe, take its time, it all flows out perfect. all of Mark's foolishness, the blackout came out great, and I can kick it over to assembly. Will finally got the demon head done so we could get it all put together. I knew Mark was excited to get some of the stuff on the car, so I grabbed him and had him give me a hand. I'm actually really excited to see this car done myself. All right, so this one's gotta go here, right? Yep. And then this one goes into that. Bottom. And then down here. these two here. Okay. Yep, and then two, two up on the side that go to the fender. Great, okay. So I'll just make sure. You want me to just put the end one in first? Probably, yeah. Yeah, that's the easiest. Makes the most sense. Well, it's nice when they go together like that. Beautiful. We really haven't done very many A-bodies, and there's a small group of people out there that absolutely love them. But by and large, in, in the popular world of Mopars, they are less desirable. They're less valuable, they're less desirable. We did do one a few years ago for Jim DeLucci, the 72 Duster 344 speed car, if you guys remember that one. He had bought it when he was very, very young, 16 years old, ended up selling it. 40 years later, he comes to me and says, can you build me a twin to it? He had the Monroney sticker, so we were able to duplicate the car. Now there's a guy who loves his car. 
every single weekend I get a text from him or a Facebook message with him going to another show, winning another trophy. You should see him. I, I know we have pictures. Tiny, find some pictures of that guy standing next to those trophies. Everywhere he goes, there's somebody that loves it, drives it, and cherishes it, and that's an A-body. So you can love all these different cars. It doesn't have to be a million dollar car. Bottom one started. Okay, all started. There we go. Good. So look at how nice that just begins to finish off the front end of that car. It's amazing how beautiful everything is when it's new and fresh and restored the way it's supposed to be. Absolutely gorgeous. I love that. This was such a straight car when it first came in, wasn't it? It, it was a good, it was a real straight non-rec car. Okay. But it was pretty rusty. Uh, we did a lot of panels on it. Really? Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I had forgot how many panels. I was looking back through pictures recently and I, it, I realized how many there were. <laughs> so just real quick, I'll explain what I meant by a lot of rust. As, as I had mentioned earlier, it did have some rust issues. I don't want to give people the impression it was a rust bucket. It was not. It was a good, complete car, although it was partially disassembled and wearing its original paint when it came to me. But after we got it back from dipping, that's when, of course, you find out all your sins. As I mentioned, we ended up doing the trunk floor and the trunk floor extensions. Really, the quarter panels, the front and behind wheel opening areas needed to be replaced down low, but the rest of the quarters are completely original. So in the world of, of replacing parts, that's not terrible. We had a lot of little patches to do, like in the frame rail, we had a patch. In the cow side panels, we had a patch. We had some little ones in the front of the rocker that we had to address. You know, a lot of little things like that that don't really compromise how much metal is original on a car. To me, the biggest thing was that his hood was ironically just rotten. Uh, so rotten that we ended up getting another hood and making it into a true uh, 1971 Dodge Demon hood, but we had his original one and we never dipped it. It was quite a bit. Uh, this side, you not got it fitting the same way it did the other day. Which is good or bad? <sighs> what bad? Gotcha. Okay, this thing was nice and sucked in when I first did I this. That that's, that's nice. Better. One thing I really like about having Mark around when it comes to, you know, doing some of the assembly on some of these things is if you have to hit something, it's his shop. He can hit it. He owns this place. And uh, it's out of my hands if something happens. Because if I hit it, breaks or cracks, that's on me. I know it sounds funny, but it's true. Okay, so he's gonna finish tightening down the last two bolts on the balance, and the next thing we're gonna put in are the front side markers. Notice this is chrome. That's because it's a Dodge. Dodge chrome their bezels on a lot of their cars. Not all of them, because Tony gets mad when I say all of them. He'll tell me some car that they didn't. But on this car, the front end is a Dodge Dart. The back end is a Plymouth Duster. So on the Dodge Dart fenders, you got a chrome bezel. Isn't that pretty? But what Mopar didn't want, Dodge didn't want, was to mix that with a duster, which is what the back end of the car is, painted bezel, so they actually chromed the bezel from the factory so that it would match the front. It's a really neat thing to see, so they would have had to make this part in chrome. Yeah. This would have had to have a different part number on it. We have to oh, a full-on totally. different part number? It would have to be, right? Okay. They had, they had painted ones, most of them were painted, some of them were chrome. This would right. have had to have the chrome part wow. number on it. So we sent them out and had them re-chromed. Beautiful little piece right there. Yeah, they turned out really nice. And the nice. only other thing to show you on this is the retainer that's going to hold these in the front. See these little cutters right here? These are designed to cut into the paint because this is going to count on this unit grounding it. There is no individual ground for it. It counts on this grounding to the fender, grounding to the light. So you want to put the side marker in? Let's do it. I'm going to have to ask Tony whether or not these are the same as a Challenger or a Charger. I bet it could be. No, these these would swoop up to like a point. On a Challenger, they yeah. would. So maybe a Charger? A Charger doesn't Boss. swoop up. Yeah, maybe it's a, like a, a 70. 70 Charger. Yeah. Yeah, they don't, yeah. Okay, so he's going to put the retainer on. Look how nice that looks. You got that camera, boy? Isn't that beautiful? Love that new stuff. So I know the guy's anxious to get it back. We've had it for quite a while. But I'm going to kind of be sad to see it go in as much as it's the only Mr. Norm's car we've ever had a chance to work on. 
Got it? Yep. Great. Okay, let's go put the other side on. You ready? All right. I'm liking that. Centered in the opening, ready when you are. Go back just a hair. Yeah, you have to set these just right in there because you, there's a little movement. So if it's not squared right in the opening of the side marker, it's not going to look right. So go forward, backwards, up, down, whatever you have to do to get it. That's it right there. So I think the best part's coming up. Hood scoops and hood pins. Oh yeah. Is that what we got left? And rear side markers. Nice. Okay, that looks great. Right there. Got it, beautiful. Now the fun part. We're gonna put on the hood scoops and hood pins next and rear side markers if we have time. So, remember the slaughtered lamb? American Werewolf in London. I call it a woof, like Teen Wolf. Remember Teen Wolf with Michael J. Fox? That was good. The sequel to it with Justin Bateman was not so good. Jason? Whatever. Jason Bateman, yeah. Now, I know not everybody gets to see every episode of Graveyard Cars, but something interesting, if you look while we're working on the hood, uh, you see the holes in the hood. Tony D'Agostino was out, the sandwich man. And we went over a 71 Demon that's very similar to this and had an opportunity to talk about our hypothesis on what these holes were. The thing that's real interesting is it's not on the car, but I'm, you probably have one around here because it's the same air cleaner used on an e-body. The 1771 340 air cleaner is a very unique air cleaner. With, with the oval opening? Right, has two oval openings. Um, not, it's weird, it's like they left the snorkels off, why not? Right. And my theory is that on the, on the A-bodies, well, 70 Dart specifically started, it's, it's essentially same hood because I believe that they were meant to have ducts that connect to the hood, to the hood open. Because they're not functional, but they're cut out. Right. They were right. wide open and they had, I don't know where his are at. They call it diffusers. Uh, they were these rubber gaskets that went around. It's a grommet opening, grommet. right? Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there were other muscle cars in that area that used yeah, you know, almost four dryer, but rye. I was going to say. Four four did. Exactly what I was Because they had say. the stuff from underneath the bumper. That it was came coming in. off the beak. Yep. Yeah. They built these in Hamtramck. So yeah, anybody that worked at Hamtramck in 1970 and 71 that was involved with these, tell us why it's all set up for cold air induction. Lined up. Yep. Lined up, lined up, lined up, lined up. Perfect. Okay, I'll go ahead and raise it up. You're gonna have to hold the scoop in place. That's how I sound in the mornings, by the way. Is that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how my wrists sound. Go ahead and hold on to this so it can't my move. My knees, anywhere. my wrists. Oh, yeah. My back. It sucks getting old. Wait till you get older. I'm in my 40s now, so. I said this before. It's really nice to work with guys like Mark and Tony because they really know their stuff. I never paid much attention to the holes in the hood until Mark told me about them and how it looks like they were supposed to be a cold air induction hood. That's a pretty cool fact. You wish, right? I do. <laughs> I don't know what happened to the 40s. I don't know what happened to the 50s. I remember the 30s pretty good. It's so weird that you just, I don't know why. Maybe nothing significant happened in those. I don't know. Too much drugs? Well, it was drinking. 30, I think, oh, well, that was way earlier. I don't, <laughs> I don't remember my 20s, you know, so I didn't say that. Yeah. Yeah. Everything starts to turn into a blur after a certain time. They all, all the years just blend together. And it goes faster yeah. and faster and faster and faster. It felt like my son was just born, and now he's already three. Yep, and it'll go faster. The older you get, they, they keep saying that, but it is true. Now, if you want to talk about time flying, the best example of it for our Graveyard Cars fans that have been tuned in for a long time is take a look at the pictures in MN, uh, season one, episode one, called MS Car. She's, a, she's brand new. She's like a few days old. And look at her now. She's not real friendly with the pictures right now. She's not stage where they're not huge fans of it. But I did manage to snap a picture. You will not recognize her. She's a beautiful lady, but she ain't that little baby anymore. And that's just 10 years going by. Maybe 11 or 12, it doesn't matter, okay? I'm still in my late 40s. These are exact replicas of those. Those, these are Fasteners. originals. I think these are original, or are these the new ones from plastic that we got? No, these, these the, are the scoops original. are original, but the fasteners, they're a reproduction. The fasteners are reproduction. They're identical, yeah, yeah, they look good. So these were his original scoops. I don't know if you can see all this, but there's the Chrysler Pentastar and the original part number. And the reason it's a 29 part number is this is the same scoop 
If you had like a 69 Dodge Coronet with a Ram Charger hood, this would be the scoop you would get on that. Or a 70 uh, with a Ram Charger hood. But it's got the part number, it's got the Pentastar, and you can also tell, see that little shoulder on there? That keeps this thing from screwing in too far. And then these are the originals that we had re-chromed. So they came out really nice. They get a silver highlight here, and they get the chrome there. So they're really nice, nice part. I'm gonna put my hand in there as a sacrifice if I need it. I'm lined up. Beautiful. You good? Perfect. Overall, it's really coming out nice. Very It'd be clean. a nice, clean little car. Very clean. And it's just gone together so nicely. Yeah. I love that. Past few cars have gone together super nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Ledford was so, such a nice car when it showed up. It was just a dream. Gay was too. Yeah. His 71 Runner. It was yep. a really, really, was, just a sweet car. It's probably my two favorite ones. I agree completely with Mark on this. When I put a drivetrain together on a car like Mr. Gay's 71 Roadrunner or the blue Super B 446 pack, I can tell without seeing the car how nice it was to begin with. I know this car was a nice complete car too. But because it was from the Midwest, all the suspension parts were completely rusted and pitted. We had to use donor parts on the hard parts that don't get replaced. I know we had to find a date coated eight and three quarter rear end housing because of the pitting that his had. All of the front suspension was just rotted and pitted, like the upper and lower control arms, tie rod sleeves, drag link. Even the K-member had hours of body work before it could get painted. But I was fortunate because we had the parts to use. Okay, while well, he's bolting that down, I'll show you this. So these are the hood pin bezels. Now, I just want to show this because we've actually never talked about this before. These are a cup shape. So when these go down and into place, they set up against this gasket like that and they actually pinch that gasket in there. So this is just a really solid quality piece right here. You finish it off with a, a nice, beautiful new screw like that, and you've got the right look. Set that down there for you. Okay, knock yourself out. There you go. Wow, I love that chrome. Absolutely stunning. Oh yeah, just finishes off the hood so nicely. I think the blackout on the hood really helps it out a lot too. Just imagine walking into a dealership and seeing that. Once we finished working on the car, my little contribution to it, I think he actually put the side markers in after I was finished. We let it down and rolled it out in the middle of the shop. I really wanted to get a look at that thing with, that, with the trim and the ornamentation, at least most of it on there. And when you stand back and look at that front end, it is clean, it's sleek, but boy, is it muscly. When you look at those scoops on there with the blackout, it's, it's not just clean and sleek, it's muscle. You look down the side of the car, very, very clean. Now, we still have graphics to do. We have a side stripe and a back end stripe to do. But even just sitting there with the wheel opening moldings on it, the mirror, the outside handle, the chrome, the trim, it's beautiful. It's really verging on a bit of a rich look. Get around to the back end and those demon taillights, very unique in the demon, that is total class. That takes it from classy at the back end, muscly at the front end, and just rich as hell down the side. That's a really beautiful car and I can't wait to see it done. Still to come, with the ultra rare Mr. Norm's Dodge Demon at a stopping point, the ghouls shift gears to a 1969 Tribute Charger. But a graveyard dream isn't always a dream build. Right along with this made-to-order monster accelerating through metal, mud, and final paint on its way to getting a J-Code Hemi automatic engine. Coming up, when Graveyard Cars returns. So I was sitting at home with my new baby, who is only three weeks old, Tiny Trey, my dad calls him, but his name is actually Giannis. And my dad sent me over a link to the new autopsy reports, since I can't do them this season. Hi, I'm Cousin Dougie. That was bad, that was horrible. Hi, I'm Cousin Dougie. What, do I start now? So I'm no critic, but I do have eyes and a brain, and I can tell that my inheritance is about to go up in flames. 
E63 represents a uh, 380, 384 barrel something. So I told my dad that he can stay home with Tiny T and I'll go in and do the autopsy reports, okay? You're welcome. This all original 1970 Cuda came off the Hamtramck assembly line with a 426 Hemi and four speed manual transmission. It's still wearing its original EK2 vitamin C paint. It's one of 284 ever made, and it also happens to be the subject of this week's autopsy report. So remember when you're reading a fender tag that you go from left to right, bottom to top. So let's start at the left lower corner. E74 represents a 426 Hemi. D21, four speed manual transmission. BS23 means it's a Barracuda, special price class, and a two door hardtop. R0B, R means 426 Hemi. Zero means 1970, which represents the model year. And B represents the assembly plant, which is Hamtramck, Michigan. And just FYI, all Hemi Cudas were built in Hamtramck, Michigan. 199578 is the serial number. Okay, next row up, starting on the left. EK2, which is vitamin C orange. H6X9 is all vinyl, black bucket seats. 000, one piece interior trim panel. B22 represents when the car was built, which is November 22nd, 1969. 001820 is the shipping order number. Going up a row on the left, EK2. This means the top of the car is painted vitamin C. A04, basic radio group. A33, track pack axle package. A62, rally instrument cluster. C55, bucket seats. G33, left hand outside chrome racing mirror. Up to the next row, J45, hood pin tie downs. M21, drip rail moldings. M25, body sill moldings. M31, body belt moldings. M88, deck molding treatment. N41, dual exhaust. On the next row, we have N42, bright exhaust tips. N85, tachometer. N96, shaker hood, which is mandatory on all Hemikudas. R11, AM, music master radio. Y05, means build to US specs. And then here at the top, we have 26. That means 26 inch radiator, which by the way, is also mandatory on all Hemikudas. EN1. That means this is the end of this sales code and also the end of this week's autopsy report. Thanks guys. It's a thing of beauty, isn't it? 1969 Dodge Charger SE. Charger excitement in a stunning new special edition. Packed with extras that aren't extra on this one. In here, a world of vinyls and leathers and wood grain luxury. A new front grille just for looks, and an optional 440 Magnum V8 just for kicks. Charger's special edition for 1969. I saw a really neat car that's going through the shop right now is a Graveyard Dreams car. This is where you call me up, say, I've always wanted a 69 Hemi Charger. Well, good luck going out and buying one of those. They're, they're a lot of money. So. I had a guy call up say he wanted a 69, he wanted it to look exactly like a Hemi Charger relative to everything, except not all dolled out with all the stripes and all the weird stuff on it. So he has commissioned me to build a 69 Charger that started life as a 318 into a 426 Hemi automatic with a Dana 60 354 gears, triple black, well actually double black, black exterior, no vinyl top, no bumblebee stripe and black interior. So I've been working on taking the original car, which didn't look too bad when we first got it. If you look at pictures of it, it was a fairly clean, straight car. But once we got it dipped, that's when you find all the mud on it, lots of sins underneath it. But all the metal work's done on it. The body work has been done on it. I want to kick it over to Will so he can get started painting on it. But one of the things I needed to have done, because it's getting a 426 Semi, is to install the subframe connectors that we're using now. These are really cool neat piece that needs to go in a car if you're going to put that much horsepower in. I really love these subframe connectors. They really fit the bottom of the car like a glove. I enjoy how well made they are and how low profile they are. 
Since these things are so flush with the floor, it's really nice because you can weld them solid from front to rear. Basically, you're tying the front and rear unibody together with steel and prevents it from twisting or sagging. So we got this 69 Charger, it's a Hemi Tribute car. It's going black, gorgeous car. Because it is black, I'm able to get right on it and panel paint the whole thing, where with the metallic, I can't do that. So I can do this whole car in pieces. You know, painting these cars apart, it is a little more time consuming, but it is easier. But you gotta get the jam work done first, and then once all the jam work's done and it's fully cured, then we can flip it over and start the paint on the other side. So once all the jam work's completely knocked out, I grab all the parts and pieces, put them in the booth, and then I start the single stage process. I use the 9300, which is a high solids single stage. It's a great product, but you gotta be very careful with it and give it time in between coats so you don't have like solvent pop or something like that. But the end result is a super high finish and it buffs out gorgeous. The standard engine in the 1969 Charger RT is the potent 440 cubic inch Magnum V8. And there's only one step up from there, the 426 Hemi. And it moves. So when it came to doing the body of the car, I had Brody prep this car from start to finish. Um, we're almost at that point where I can completely cut him loose. So I looked the car over, Brody did a great job getting all the prep work done. So now at this point, the car's gonna go in the booth, he's gonna mask it up. Hang on. Uh, what are you doing? Do that again. Do what again? Just, okay, so where are we at right now on the 69 Charger? What is this? This is the new Trey sound. No, this is dumb. No, this isn't dumb. This is this, actually brilliant. It's not even a go microphone. Ahead. No, this isn't stupid. That's not this a, is a, what is, no, it's a real microphone, it's, it's a Bluetooth. It's, no, it's not. Don't be a fool. So where are we at on the 69 Charger? He's getting ready to paint it. No, we're, 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 we're elaborate on that a little bit more. Brody did a great job. He got the charger all prepped. Right, and I'm let's talk to the audience and talk to me. Brody did a great job prepping the car, and at this point, I'm gonna go in the booth and spray it. Uh, one more time with some enthusiasm. I can't be enthusiastic when I got this stupid- Oh, I'll pull it back. Is that scaring you? Is that better? Well, I just don't want it all up in my mouth. All I'm doing is I'm, nobody's getting in your mouth. Don't flatter yourself, just- Sir? You, go. Brody did a great job prepping the car. It's in the booth. I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna spray it black, and it's gonna come out great. Did he mask it up and prep it like the notes say? It's all masked up, ready to paint. Okay, well that sounds great. Um, what is the first thing you do now that it's in the booth before you start painting it? Wax and grease it. Wax and, wax and grease? Correct. And then? Well, you said that, you just asked for the first thing. No, I need to know what you're, look at the note. Well, I don't, first thing I do is lay down the sealer, I use blah, blah, blah. I so we don't blah, clean blah, the blah, car first? On it. Why don't you tell us in your own words? I, this is just I a wax clue. and grease. The, you just told me to fuck. I told you what's written down because these are the bullet points. These I wax and grease points. the car, tack and blow it, and then put a coat of sealer on it. What kind of sealer are you using? DP50. DP50, is that a regular sealer? Yeah. From, who makes that? PPG. How many coats of uh, sealer do you put on there? One. How long do you wait after the sealer before you start top coating it? One hour. All right, you should repeat it back to me in the form of a question. I don't top coat it for at least an hour. Okay, that wasn't a question. I know. All right. What's it like to paint with sealer versus paint itself? Does it lay out any differently? Do you have to adjust your air pressure? I mean, we're trying to help people at home learn how to paint. Oh, well, it's hard to know if you were being silly or do I try to teach people? If we're teaching people at home, I don't need this. Um, I'll put the first coat of sealer on, give it an hour, lays out nice. You can go in, see if you had like any pinhole you might miss, a sand scratch, any imperfections before you get to go over it with uh, single stage. Because once you go over it with single stage, you can't fix anything, you're kind of committed at that point. You're kind of committed at that point. Yeah. 
So what kind of paint are you gonna paint it with, Will? So we use our PPG, we mix this four to two to one. Four to two to one. I was in the middle of talking. I'll do four coats, and because it's such a thick product, I give it about an hour in between Super each. Super thick. Between each coat, because if you get on top of it too fast, it'll probably solvent pop. So I have to give it an hour, and it'll take a good portion of the day to get this car painted. Do you have a particular pattern or style that you like to do as you lay down the color? Not on a solid color. I do not. So would you, is it fair to say you just start at the bottom of the rocker and then you jump over to the other side and then maybe to the back? It or depends. do you have a rhythm? It depends. A lot of times I'll start at the top of the roof. Starts at the top of the roof. And work my way down to the bottom of the rocker and then go to the other side of the car and repeat the same steps. That's fantastic. What do you do after you've done that the first time? Have a cup of coffee, tell Heather I love her, and then wait one hour. Loves Heather, waits an hour. Now, after you've done the paint work on it, how long does it have to set? Don't you want to talk to this? <laughs> after you've done the paint work, do you lay it out exactly the way you want it to look? Or do you put it on with like a little bit of orange peel and you know it'll flow out? Tell the people what to expect from the paint. So my last coat, there is a little bit of peel in it because especially on a black car, you don't want to have a run or any issue because you're not going to get it out 100% more than likely. So I'd rather have a So little... it's fair to say that the blacks are harder to work with? No. That's really great to hear. Okay, let me just turn over here. In your own words, I want you to say exactly. It's funny because when I was a kid, I remember people talking about how straight and perfect a body had to be to paint it black. At GYC, everything we do is perfect. So any car that we prep could be black. In your own words, but exactly like that. <laughs> See what you did there. Paintwork went superb on the 69 Charger. Will was involved with the final panel assembly over in the assembly shop. A lot of pieces to put on there, but when it's all done right and the wet sand's done right and the buffing's done and the undercoating's done, it really is just a matter of final assembly. When assembling these cars, we start with the doors. And uh, once we get those basically set where we think they need to be, we move on to the fenders. After the fenders are in place, next part's the hood. We really need everything on the car before we can do final fitment. There's multiple gaps that you got to align, so having every piece on there, you can't get it quite right until they're all there. So once the hood's on there, we just do a little bit of final fitment, and then bam, we got it. There you go. Oh. Thank you, Will. That's stressful. Stay tuned. Now that the 1969 Tribute Charger has been reinforced with new subframe connectors and made its way through body, mud, and final paint, Mark and Cousin Dougie are finally ready to install the massive J-Code 426 hemispherical engine built to factory specifications. Coming up in the conclusion of Graveyard Cars. The engine and transmission we built for this car came out nice. We started with a Mopar Performance 426 Hemi block. We built it out to factory specifications because the gentleman wants this to be as close to an original Hemi J-Code car as possible. We built out a 727 Hemi torque flight to factory specs as well. The rear axle is a new Mosier Dana 60 axle with 354 gears. And the K-member and front suspension are all restored to OEM assembly line specifications.
Doug and I are getting ready to install the 426 Hemi in our 1969 Dodge Charger dream car. Doug's built out most of this stuff. I actually bought this car for a guy out of Florida and his intention was to have a 69 Hemi Charger RT look-alike with air conditioning, which was not available by the way. You could not get air conditioning in a 426 Hemi or any cold air induction cars because there wasn't enough room for those air cleaners and the AC compressor. Classic Auto Air is providing us with a low profile compressor and all the bracketry so we can run air conditioning on our charger. Nice. Now the other thing we learned last time, right Doug? Uh-huh. When we put a Hemi in was to take the passenger side valve cover off. <laughs> Quite the hard way. There's not enough room for all. You can either take the steering gear off, which makes it easy, or you take off the right-hand valve cover. So Doug is going to take the right-hand valve cover off of it. There we go. All right, isn't that pretty? Look at that. Ooh. Then we are going to raise it up into the car, install the cross member and the K-member bolts. We've already installed the rear end, and then we'll be able to let it down and put our craggers on it and our tires and roll this mother around the shop. So if you look at that engine going up into the cavity of the charger, you can see why they call it the elephant. That's a huge footprint. You can also see where if that passenger's valve cover was still in place, the way it protrudes out past the rockers would either scuff the valve cover, which we've done many times, like on the Seafoam Turquoise 1969 Roadrunner. We end up having to touch up the valve covers on that. The 1970 Dodge Charger RT ended up scuffing that. So we've learned if we take them off like we have here, we have that extra inch and a half or two of clearance. And while an inch and a half doesn't seem like much, it is. And it makes a big difference in the end when you're stuffing an engine in something. Okay, so we got the engine and transmission in. We're gonna get everything buttoned up. Put the upper control arms in place. Torsion bars, and then we'll let it down and See if we can round up some wheels and tires for it. Good job, Dougie. Thank you, Mark. So the drivetrain in the car went in perfectly. It's beautiful. This car is really going to be a neat one when it's finished. You look underneath it, and you know it's all 1969 Hemi Charger. That's what it looks like from the underside. We rolled it out into the middle of the shop. We actually had to pull it away from the assembly tech that we assigned it to. He was so anxious to start putting parts on it that I think he put handles and mirrors and glass in it before we could get our final shots of just the drivetrain. But when you stand back now and you look at that car, you can see that it's, if nothing else, it's very, very sleek. It looks tough, it looks sinister. The guy that had us build the car for him was a big fan of the Stephen Queen movie, Bullet. You all know what that is. And uh, he wanted to keep it plain. But when you put a car like that plain and you stand back and look at it with the Craigers, with the wheels, the tires, and now it's got a little bit of chrome on it, that is just a sinister, wicked looking car. When you look at all that, put it together as a package of 426 Hemi. This will be one for the record books. This is a graveyard dreams car that should bring years of enjoyment to him just like the little duster did for Mr. Gucci. Dream maker.